Pastor Larry is teaching us today on immeasurably more, measurably more. Now, uh, some, some things to be thinking about today. I'm going to take you forward to Colossians. We're going to go to Romans at some point because when we begin this concept of measuring, and that's really what happens. Um, we happen to be people who are finite. Um, we recognize that there is always boundaries, if you will. Um, human nature is such that we look for those boundaries. You, you have been said that. Um, you have said that about people in this room. I wonder what their boundaries are. Um, Steve Campbell. Eric Frank, yes. You know, uh, you know, do they even know where the boundary is? You know, their their poor mothers. Oh my gosh. So, so that's right. No boundaries. We, on a serious note, we, we are all that way. We we are looking for boundaries. Uh, I have managed people before that have come to me frustrated and, and they have said, I just need to know my boundaries. And if you know me, I'm like, what do you need to know that for? That limits you, right? But some people are like that. They, they need to know okay, what am I allowed to do, what I'm not allowed to do? What are the rules? Where are the lines? Okay, and that's okay. But all of us, ultimately, even when I joke that, you know, I don't like boundaries because they interfere, uh, at the end of the day, we're all recognizing or realizing there are some, right? If nothing else, we recognize that there is a time when we won't be here anymore right not on this earth and and so we we kind of get it but we begin to use scripture that talks about uh immeasurably more it's hard for us to be in finite to begin to think about the infinite um we have used this before in this class from psalm 103 um uh, as far as the east is from the west god remembers your sin no more Okay, and, and that's hard to imagine how far is the east from the west. It's kind of infinite, right? And, and so as we begin to think about these concepts, um, the reason I, I, I give you that introduction is because in truth, in truth, um, we have a struggle with understanding an infinite God. How can God love me that much how can he forgive me that much how can he be patient with me that much you know and and so it's hard for us to comprehend this kind of conversation but today pastor larry challenges and i will too that we need to remember that there is some methods if you will they aren't the only ones but there are some ways maybe some some techniques that will help us to maybe expand that a little bit right so, is our professional orator ready? Yes, sir. Okay. With this new technology that Chris Voice has given us, the Jarba or whatever it's called, uh, you can hear the voice of God if he happens to speak through that, but they can hear your voice as well. So, when you're ready, ma'am. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is a work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. 
Certainly. Now, we the first the first thing I want to point out to you is uh, Paul says something to us. It's interesting. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. So let's have a conversation on his position of prayer important. Is position of prayer important? So when you're praying, is the position of your physical body important? Yes, ma'am. I think it can. Okay. I mean, go further. Well, if you need a prayer on the fly, you're not going to drop to your knees where it is that you are. I mean, you might drive in a car. You know, um, I, I think it depends on. Prayer. I've seen some of you drive. Don't <laughs> yeah, you, you need all the help you can get. Don't close your eyes either. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good point. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I think it's attitude rather than position of the body. It's the attitude of the mind where it's at. I like that. Ken, can you go a little further? I like it. Keep going. <laughs> well, it, it was great wisdom anyway, okay. <laughs> An attitude of the heart. An attitude of the heart, okay. So you might remember I've told this story before. Uh, Stonewall Jackson was a uh, very devout uh, Christian, and he also really came from a very... Uh, old-fashioned church, uh, not, not primitive Baptist, but pretty close, um, and he was taught that the only way you can pray is with your eyes closed and your hands folded and your head bowed, and you had to pray that way, or it didn't really count, uh, but he loved to walk in nature, so he tried to pray by walking in nature in the woods with his head down and his hands clasped and his eyes closed and he said and too many tree lamps. And then he realized that it didn't matter to God whether his hands were folded and his eyes were closed or his head was bowed. And I, I think there is great reality and truth in that. So I think all of your responses are correct. I would say this too. <clears throat> Position of the heart is absolutely essential, but Look, our God is a God of greatness and infinity. He's a God of immeasurably more than we can imagine. So for you to get hung up on, am I in the right state of mind right now? Am I in the right position of the body? Is not where you need to start. Don't let that get in your way. Um, <coughs> In Romans chapter 8, um, it, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, you know, that um, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. Okay, so there are times in our lives when we know we have to talk to God and we don't know how to do it. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to approach him. And, and I think it's really important that you got to get past the Lord's prayer and you got to get past what you feel is important because in communal worship, I think it is appropriate for you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And, and, and I think there are times at the communal rail, if you're physically able, it is appropriate to kneel and bow your head and clasp your hands, close your eyes and pray. Yep, that's good. And that's the right thing to do. But please do not let any of that get in the way of you approaching God. Okay? <clears throat> don't, don't get hung up on these things because God wants to hear from you and me. And, and you know what? First of all, whatever position you're going to be in, whatever <laughs> words you use and whatever mindset you might have, it ain't good enough anyway for a holy, perfect God. Okay? So get past that, right? He is a God who, as it says here, is immeasurably more, immeasurably more in love with us and caring about us and looking beyond us than we can imagine. Yes, Beverly. Doug, I, I totally agree with everything, everything that has been said. God's going to take us where we are and hear us where we are in whatever form our body in. I think, though, when we are physically able, at times, 
we should get on our knees. Um, maybe it's when we're at our lowest, but maybe when we're at our our, our highest, okay? to show respect for who he is, to bow down and be submissive that we're requesting help. But by, by no means is it um, a permanent standard. I think it, it should be a practice when we're able, just out of respect and showing that we are committed to, to God's way. Have you ever talked to somebody and you didn't know what to say? You didn't know how to say it. And, and you would you would say to them, am I making any sense? Do you know what I mean? You ever done that? Yeah, have, have you ever said, have you ever said, I'm not sure how to put this in words and I, I really don't know how to articulate this to you, but do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? And we've done that before, haven't we? Or maybe somebody's come to you, okay? Or, or maybe, you know, when you listen to Eric Frank, you go, I'm not sure what he said. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, <laughs> Kathy, you've been there, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to my world, right? So, <clears throat> so I, I think, I, I, I hope you hear this. When you approach God, just approach him. Okay, just approach him. If, if he sent his son to die for us, He's going to get past the fact that you don't know how to, you don't know how to approach him. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. You don't know whether your eyes should be open or closed or whatever the case may be. Now, I will circle back around to what Beverly said. I would highly recommend at times that there is nothing better than getting on your knees and praying to a holy God. What puts you in place? Yeah, there is there is a submissiveness about that. There is a uh, a recognition of of God as who He is. But by no means is that you do not hear need to hear your Sunday school teacher saying that's the only way you can pray. Okay. Yes, ma'am. When we were on our first mission trip to Nashville, and we stayed at a huge old church in downtown, and Sue and I we we took the girls in the evening into the dark sanctuary was it on, and literally we laid flat face down we laid flat and just prayed we cried we, you know it was and it was the most powerful thing to just completely yeah, yeah. <clears throat> prostrate before prostrate before the lord is a uh, is a way that, that that's described and and there is a there's a power in that too yeah. so again I think, though, to, to begin in this conversation of is the position of prayer important? Um, again, God is a holy God, and, and I cannot stand before him. Okay? I won't be able to stand before him. Um, and the song, I can only imagine, you know, why it touched so many people. You know, um, you know, the concept of will I bow, will I, will I kneel, what will I do, you know, and I uh, I think if you get hung up on that in your prayer life, it will prevent you from approaching a God who is so holy that he sent his son to die for us so that we didn't have to be holy, right? And think about the beauty of that is you can talk to God any form, any fashion, any language, any word that you want to. Um, during COVID, we, we celebrated at West Oaks Farm Market because we couldn't meet as a church on Easter, right? And so we all stayed in our cars and we watched the sunrise. And I encouraged everybody out loud. We were all on speaker phones, right? And, and I encouraged everybody to pray simultaneously, however you wanted to pray. And, and if you would have been listening, you would have said, wow, that is, who can understand that? Well, there's a God in heaven who understood that. He heard every individual voice. He knows every individual story. And he knows what's behind those words. Isn't that cool? So I want you to begin to understand prayer is you go as you are. Um, whatever you say, he'll figure it out, right? He'll figure it out. Eric, did you want to? I'm sorry. You Just something on this line. <clears throat> years and years and years ago, before most of us knew him, John Kane was a prisoner of war in Hanoi Hilton, and uh, he prayed, prayed, 
prayed and he was abused and tortured and this and that. And he got to the point that he couldn't pray. And then after the fact, he said, all I knew is that God heard my beating. Yeah, and, and appreciate that there are many people today who don't have a relationship with God, who are so desperately trying to figure out who God is in their life, and what he means. And so um, that that's the beauty of God. You know, there are people who say, well, can a non-Christian pray to God? And the answer is, why not? Because at one point you weren't a Christian. So if, if the answer is you can only pray to God if you're a Christian, how do you become a Christian? To pray to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. So, so you know, we got to go beyond these rules. Now, there are times in our church upstairs during the worship service, there is an appropriateness to style and form and fashion. Okay. There's an appropriateness to that. But I, I think in your in your time to recognize when God calls you to prayer, uh, you just do it. But look, folks, it's a habit. So it's really hard for you and I to have a relationship if we see each other for a few seconds on a Sunday. I mean, we have a relationship, but it's not maybe as deep as we would want it to be, right? But when we talk all the time, our relationship deepens. It becomes stronger. We get to know each other better. We trust each other more. We have greater faith in one another. So I would tell you the same thing is true with God when you pray. So if you're praying on Sunday morning only, not the rest of the week, it's kind of hard to get to know God really well, right? He knows you fine, but it's hard for you to get to know him. So position of prayer, it can be important to you. Whatever is important to you, that's fine. But do not let it get in the way of your prayer time. Now, verses 14 and 15. Um, I want to read that to you again so that you get it. Um, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. Um, it's an interesting concept. I want to take you to Colossians, which is two books over. General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, okay? So Colossians is two over to the right. And 1, 12 through 14, let me read it to you. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people and the kingdom of light, okay? Giving joyful thanks to the Father. He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the light of the kingdom, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So there's this concept that Paul's talking about in Ephesians that he goes further to, and when he writes to the church of Colossae, um, the Colossians, and, and he talks about the same father, same family. So today, I think it's important we talk about the immeasurability of God, okay, is we got to kind of think about the same father, the same family. So what does that look like? And if you noted, there, there's plenty of answers here, but there's five that I really want to push in on you today to think about. Number one that we see in Colossians 1, 12 through 14 is we share in the inheritance. We share in God's inheritance, so if you uh, have somebody in your family who is ready to let their inheritance go, it doesn't always have to be a death. We can kind of think that way, right? We think in will, last will, testament, but it can be done even prior to that. You can disperse some of your inheritance to your family or to whoever you want to well in advance. A lot of, of um uh, 501c3 organizations, uh, charitable organizations, they will encourage people, and sometimes very good state planning, to give some of their inheritance in advance. They still have access to it, a living will or trust, if you will, but they have access to it, but they start getting it early, right? So this is God's concept here, that you share in the inheritance. Does it mean we share in the inheritance? We're the same group, we're the same family, right? 
So when, when Paul starts talking about, uh, you know, this concept from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, he's talking about you are part of his family. Okay, so you have that inheritance that you can look forward to. All right, and here's the good news. Not only do you have that to look forward to in eternity, but you have that here as well. Okay, so when you start thinking about your faith, a lot of times we, we keep thinking that it's futuristic, <clears throat> that it's only when I die. And that's the beauty of why, uh, that's, that's one of the really cool things is you begin to, uh, to study uh, Christ, okay? Uh, when you become a disciple of that kind of concept of studying, you begin to realize that Jesus came for three years to teach and to model and to mold, okay? So that he had people understand that the kingdom is here. It's not just in heaven, it is here. The kingdom is among you, he says, all right? So, so when we get that concept, it's important to know that we can share in the inheritance now. You can share in God's gifts now, not just in eternity. <coughs> Number two, he rescued us from Satan, okay? Same father, same family, we've been rescued, okay? We've been rescued from Satan. Three, same father, same family, he brings us into an eternal kingdom. So when we become people of faith, not only do we share in the inheritance both now and futuristically, not only are we rescued from Satan, we're brought into the eternal kingdom today. <clears throat> not just later, but today. So it's sort of like a guarantee, right? It's sort of like Hey, it's yours. Don't worry about it. Four, he redeemed us through his blood. Through the blood of Jesus, you have been redeemed. So redeems us through his blood. So the same father who has redeemed all of us, making us all part of that family, right? <clears throat> and then finally, one concept that's really important here when Paul begins to talk about this concept of, you know, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that's where we get the name Christian. I -N means belong to or belonging to, okay? Christian, I -N, belonging to Christ. Okay, so isn't that kind of cool that we belong to him? So that's the mark, right? So um, he has forgiven our sins. Now, here's a really neat concept. And, and when I say it, you're all going to go, well, yeah, right? I would say that, me included, many Christians struggle with this concept. Even though we all go, duh, that's, that's what they teach, right? That's what we're supposed to know. But we all forget it. And that is that Christ has forgiven our sins in the past. He forgives our sins now. And he forgives our <clears throat> sins in the future. Now, I know we struggle with that. I get it. I do too. Uh, that's not a license to sin. I didn't say, hey, go out of here and, and rip a new one, okay? Go, go, <laughs> go cut her loose, all right? All right, Steve? I didn't say that, okay? <laughs> okay? Just to be Steve Campbell, I did not say that. So, so <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I, know. I heard that. It's like my wife says all the time. That's your selective hearing, Doug. Okay. So, so now listen. I, I just want you to know that that concept is that you have been forgiven. Um, you've heard Pastor Larry say that in communion. It's perfectly appropriate. Uh, pretty much every Protestant denomination will at times say that in the actual liturgy of the communion service or Eucharist. And that is that, you know, um, your sins are forgiven. That's, that's what our relationship with Christ is all about. Okay, so uh, again, both past, present, and future. And I, I say that not to give you a blank check to do whatever you want, but to assure you that Christ only had to die one time. 
only has to dial one time. Um, oh gosh, Mel Gibson's movie about uh, the crucifixion, the passion. the passion of the Christ. Um, you know, supposedly uh, in the in the in the movie where you see his the nails being driven into his hands. Uh, the actor who was doing that, Mel Gibson, who was directing, said, those will be my hands. It was his hands who were driving. He wanted that symbolism there. Apparently, he's got some mental issues along the way. But, but anyway, um, think about that concept of we, we are the ones who drive the nails in Jesus' wrist and in his feet every time we sin. Because we're, we're saying, you know, I, I know that you're here to forgive me and to die for me. And so I'm going to sin. And that I'm the one who keeps putting you on that cross. You've actually heard, maybe some of you have heard that language. Don't continue to nail Jesus to the cross. If you've ever heard that, that's the concept, okay? Every time we sin, we're, we're doing that. We, we keep throwing him back on the cross so he has to die again, so to speak, in our minds, right? But he doesn't have to. Peter writes in 1 Peter, and again in other places, he said Christ died once and for all. <clears throat> once and for all. Once and for all. Okay? All right. Very good. Now, I know that was a lot there, but that's important in our concept of our faith walk. Uh, verse 16. Uh, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. What's Paul referring to here? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. In dwelling with the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, that, that's, that's great. What disappoints me, if those of you who didn't know that, if you looked at 17, I gave you a hint here, indwelling. So, okay. All right. Not enough caffeine and sugar. <laughs> Again, I, I don't know if they're eating enough donuts, okay? All right? So we're talking about the indwelling. So look at 17 here because there's some truths here, all right? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love. So truth of indwelling. Um, I, I know that I talk about this a lot, but I think it's really important um, because a lot of Protestant churches don't talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit very often. And it's confusing. You know, we, sometimes we say, I don't see any evidence. I don't see any proof. I want to know. I want to know for sure. Those kind of things all make sense. Um, but that is the gift. And so when Paul is talking about so that Christ may dwell in your hearts, Remember the concept of a triune or the trinity of God is that Jesus does dwell in your hearts through the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he, he promised us that. Um, you know, in John 14, when he talks about in my house are many mansions or in my mansion or many rooms, depends on the translation you look at. And, and so when he's talking about heaven and he's talking about to go and prepare a place for us, <coughs> He said, if I go, then I will return to you, meaning I'll come and get you and take you back with me, all right? And so that concept is that he said, and I will send you my Holy Spirit. Uh, some translations will say, and, and I will send you the counselor, the comforter, okay? And, and I will send that to you to give you comfort and to counsel you and to be with you, okay? My representative, if you will, right? So what are we rooted in? So he says, you, that you being rooted and established in love. Some of you might say rooted. Crick, creek, roof, roof. We're rooted in the blood that Jesus shed for us. Okay, go a little further, Beverly. That's good. That's as much as I get. <laughs> Kelly, you've been described as being bright today. Show us. <laughs> <laughs> Monday, 
next year. <laughs> we're rooted in love. That's right. We're rooted in love. See, I was right. Good job. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are we to be rooted in? Um, you know, we'll we'll sometimes say to people, kind of jokingly, you know, uh, uh, what are you rooted in? In other words, what are you tied into? What's your foundation based on? Okay. And so I want you to think in concept of what are you kind of rooted into? What plants, um, you know, if you've, if you've ever dug up plants or pulled trees out of the ground and you pull a, I pulled a tree up with my loader the other day and, and uh, it was right beside of a, a bunch of block that I didn't want to tumble over and the root went underneath the block and I pulled it up. And the block all fell off. And I had to get off the loader and pick them all back up. Okay, and the bees flying around. And inside, so I thought to myself, this scripture. I said, "Gee, was it rooted in? Right? It was rooted clear underneath that pallet. All right. So, what are you rooted in? What are you rooted in? Verses seventeen through nineteen. Let me keep going. In verse eighteen, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love." That, surpass, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Um, so we have this concept of total love, unconditional love, defined love, and misunderstood love. Okay, so let's go with that. What, what are we talking about? Total love, unconditional love, defined love, misunderstood love. What do we mean? Kelly, do I need to call you again? Yeah, I'm you. Oh, you already, you've already done it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about here in this concept? I mean, he loves us no matter what. I mean, that's unconditional love. It's mm -hmm. love no matter what. Yeah, so, some would say, uh, well, that's just total love, right? That's just total love. Um, so think about the concept of immeasurably more than we can imagine. <clears throat> and that's hard. So whoever you love the most in this world, in truth, there probably are limits. There are times with, in that relationship with them where you become very frustrated, perhaps angry. Uh, there are times you may say, mm, Put your hands up and kind of step back a little bit. Um, you know, you. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, remember when my son was a teenager, I said, Son, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. And uh, at that point, I probably meant it, you know. It, ooh. So, so, you know, you think about those things, and there are times that, that that's the way we are in the unconditional love that we think we have, but we don't understand unconditionally because it's beyond our imagination. Yes, ma'am. The long is eternity to eternity. Say that again. The long. Okay. That you may grasp how wide and long, high is the highest heaven and the deep is into the depths of sin and death that he conquered. Yeah, that's well said. In fact, um, my disciples' Bible, my study Bible says it this way. God's love is total. It reaches every corner of our experience. God's love is wide. It covers the breadth of our own experience, and it reaches out to the whole world. God's love is long. It extends throughout our lives and into eternity. Okay, so think about not just now, but in the future. God's love is high. It rises to the heights of our celebration and elation. God's love is deep. It reaches to the depths of discouragement, despair, and even death. So when you feel shut out or isolated, remember you can never be lost to God's love. So think about that. You can never be lost. So as frustrated as God is with me, as angry as he can be at me because I don't do it the right way, his love extends beyond all of that, okay, beyond all of that. 
There's no stopping to it. That should give us some hope. Verses 20 and 21. Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to read quickly uh, 38, mm -hmm. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Um, you know, it, it, that's the concept that Paul's writing to the Church of Rome, and he says, "For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord." And if you think about that concept, you know, it's the same, right? And Paul, Paul has that pattern a lot in his writings. All right. Now uh, let's go to Rome. let's go to Ephesians again. Um, and let's look at 20 and 21. And I asked this question, why do you hear this in benedictions? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Why do we hear that a lot in benedictions? Pastor Larry used it this morning in the early service in the benediction. Why do we hear that in benedictions? Because he's sending us out at some point. He's giving us instructions. Okay, instructions. That's good. Yep. As we go out. Mm -hmm. As we go out. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder. It's an instruction. A takeaway. A takeaway. I want you to grab this concept too. It is a promise. It is a promise. We, we forget that our God is a God of promises. Okay, our God is a God of promises. And since our God is a holy God, he can't break promises. Okay, it's against his nature. He won't break a promise. All right, 2021, does this point to some pattern for us? So I want you to think about this. Does 20 and 21 point to a pattern for us? Look at it again. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask. Hear the concept. Measurably more than all we ask or can imagine. So there's a God who can do more than we ask and more than we can imagine. You know what I hear? We don't get how great he is. So Think about the fact there's a God in heaven that can do all these things, right? God, I'm struggling with my checkbook, you know? So, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like asking Michael Jordan, you know, can you dribble the basketball in front of me? He's going, have you seen what I can do? You don't want me to dribble basketball? You want to see what I really can do, right? Now, I'm not suggesting that, that, that God's a, a, a lottery machine, you know. He, he's, not a, he, he's not a kiosk where you go and say, okay, God, fix the checking account and, you know, take away this bad diagnosis. I'm not suggesting. What's that? Put your pen number in. Yeah, put your pen number in. Uh, yeah, so... But I do want you to hear that he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or we can even imagine, okay? So there's a, there's a pattern here that I want you to get, right? As Christians, we don't even begin to understand the concept of how great God is. So we end up going in low. Um, I have a customer that had a business and, and uh, he is rougher than a corn cob and uh, he, he's quick, he's quick to anger and quick to talk out and everything else. And he was in negotiations. He told me the story. He was in negotiations with a big company to buy him out and, and uh, he had decided that, you know, he wouldn't take a penny less than $3 million for his business. So he was meeting with them and they made their presentation. He was getting kind of anxious and he can't say a complete sentence without GD in there and everything else. And, and so he started in, his wife kicked him under the table because he was about to tell him, I won't take a penny under 3 million, kicked him under the table. And they finally said, and the best we can do is $12 million. <laughs> and he was that close to saying, I won't take a penny under three. 
<laughs> I want you to think about that. Okay. He was way too low. He's way too low. <laughs> well, I just want you to appreciate that that's the way we are with God. We, we, we just approach God in such a way that we automatically think I'm not worth it. Why would he hear me? He's got other things to do. He's too busy for me. Um, you know, there are people worse off than me. Um, all those things can be true, but that's not the way God is. That might be the way I am with you, okay? But, but it's not the way God is with us, all right? So how does it look if we approach God this way when we understand that he is immeasurably greater and holier and more wonderful than we can imagine and that we can even ask about and that we can even understand? So I leave you with this question. Are you ready for the more that God wants to give you? Are you ready for the more that he wants to give you? Pastor Larry reminds us that we have a great God who gives us immeasurably more than we can imagine or that we can ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, this, this is in fact in prayer. And um, last year, um, I would preach on Took it apart and turned it into a prayer for us. Either I, me, or we. And I prayed that every day during COVID. And I, it, when you say it every day and you really stop and ponder what you're saying, I think it helps. And, and given that it is an actual prayer, um, you know, I frequently pray certain lines of, of verses of scripture, but this is an actual prayer. And I think it really helps to drive home. Um, Great point, Kathleen. That's that's absolutely true. Yes, Nancy. I have a friend that um, one of the grandchildren is so bad, and she they have some problems here with her children. She prayed every day, and guess what? She got milk. She ran out. <laughs> it is one. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it is. She's not got one yet. It and one girl says pray every day, and she did. And within, and then within a couple of months of each other, it was like, wow, prayer does work. It's wonderful. Yeah. Now, look, th this is this was a great lesson, but I want you to appreciate that you should have some questions on your mind, and I get it. You know, how come when I've been praying for years about this, it still hadn't happened? And those are fair questions. Oh, we're out of time, though. Unfortunately, we'll have to get to that another time. Let's end the word prayer. Father God, thank you that you give us more than we can imagine and are prepared to do immeasurably more than we ask. Help us, Lord, through our faith to accept the beginning of that and through our faith to recognize that you love us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. And as a result, we have inherited and we are heirs to all that you offer. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Don't forget, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, be praying for Pastor Larry. He's having hip surgery.